So what I came across in July through the uh, stop motion time lapse photography by accident was this uh, this aerosol spraying that is showed up to be a geoengineering type experiment or possible military activity on at least a U.S. scale, possibly a, a global scale. It's not natural, the clouds are being manufactured. There's fallout from it, it's washing down in the form of rain into the water and the soil, resulting in us drinking whatever the chemicals are in this aerosol spray. And the other byproduct, which is the uh, global dimming, which is also disturbing. So whether it's a solar radiation management or geoengineering uh, effort, there are absolute side effects and, and consequences that, that may actually be catastrophic. In, an increasing amount of days um, saw these patterns occurring in the skies overhead and a subsequent diminishment of my solar uptake. And uh, it, it increased with every year. So about 2004 is when I really started my investigation as to um, what could be happening in the skies above because it was too inconsistent. One day would be a, a grid pattern and uh, another day would be uh, virtually nothing with very similar atmospheric conditions. I've, I've been studying meteorology since the late 90s as well. So clearly there was something happening and, and it, it took no time at all to come to the, the geoengineering um, issue and a mountain of data. So I researched the subject of geoengineering which seemed to describe exactly what I was seeing in the skies above which was solar obscuration. Um, that's the, the primary goal of SAG, Stratospheric Aerosol Geoengineering, and SRM, Solar Radiation Management. The primary goal of these patents like stratospheric wells box seeding for reduction of global warming was a primary patent and, and, and the stated goal is to block the sun and quite uh, clearly that's what was happening with my solar PV system. So seeing the first ingredient in that patent is aluminum, I began to do rain tests. The uh, first test was seven parts per billion which according to a um, hydrogeologist was already quite high given my location, a filtered forested location. It's not near any sort of industry, urban setting, anything. Subsequent tests over the next five years escalated as much as 3,450 parts per billion of aluminum in a single rain test. So if you have virtually every dot connecting, and we know these materials aren't coming from China, that's the first thing many people state, but California Air Quality Resources Board has done studies on the aerosols from China and aluminum simply is not amongst them. Metals don't float across oceans with the exception of mercury. Global dimming is a term most are not familiar with and, and the latest figures show fully 20% of the sun's direct rays that reached the planet several decades ago no longer do. I mean, this is the biggest elephant in the room, absolutely the biggest in the room. And, if, and I believe that if it could be brought to a level where there was enough cover for all the scientists, all the meteorologists, all the biologists, all the academia that knows this is going on, I believe they would pour from every corner. I, I do, but they, they would have to have the cover because I, I know people with California Department of Fish and Game that are absolutely beside themselves that this is going on. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk to risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought and that the side effects are harder to manage. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters. The collaborators of mine working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a federal pencil and paper but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. Geoengineers now are moving very close, quickly, to get legislation passed to spray the primary ingredients into our sky, knowing the damage that we have had, not only to human health, we've seen aluminum-related illnesses go through the roof, but what free-form aluminum, aluminum oxide, does to our environment 
is devastating, uh, and it literally destroys crops, it destroys forests, uh, it destroys our earth. We, we have an earth that, that is being molested, uh, our ozone layer is being shredded for, from top to bottom. The contrails change um, the amount of sunlight and energy that pierces the atmosphere. I mean, it's in several articles that I can show you. So the phenomena of changing how much sun gets and energy gets into our atmosphere that heats it up is printed every day. It's just printed in such a way as, as to not say this is a tool for uh, climate change. It's saying it is in fact a phenomena that will in fact change the climate by reducing the amount of sun that, that gets into our atmosphere. Geoengineering is one of the things uh, that are on the table and it'll probably be on a large enough scale that it'll be pretty obvious to everybody. And it's becoming more obvious every day. Look at the way the contrails persist and become an entire white blanket over the whole sky. Look at this photograph of the sky. I thought that the clouds looked a little strange, that's why I took some pictures. But then when I saw a plane go through the cloud and leave a void in the cloud that lasted for half an hour or so, planes don't leave holes in clouds, they're just not clouds. When you begin to introduce clouds to the sky, you're changing how much energy from the sun reaches the Earth's surface. That's a given. You're increasing cloud cover. And we've had a marked increase of high cloud cover, in particular cirrus and alto cumulus clouds over the last 30 years. The quotient or the ratio between low clouds and high clouds has nearly doubled the number of high clouds. And what you're doing is trapping heat. You're keeping some out, but when it comes to nighttime, you're pulling a blanket over. All right, let's just take a summer afternoon in LA. We have a high cloud bank come in. It won't come in in the morning, it'll come in in the afternoon. So we get all of that morning sunshine, we get all of that midday sunshine, the clouds come in, the sun begins to set in the west, the clouds thicken up. You've already got your heat in for the day. And then the clouds stick around for 70% of the night, and the heat stays. And so in late 2004, I started buying cameras. I bought two little webcams and then two other mini DV can and cameras. A little tripod, stuck them out around, out, out around the house. And then I bought two computers and time-lapse software. And so I could get north, south, southwest and then east. I was hoping to catch movement of clouds, things happening with the clouds so I could deliver a better forecast at night. What I caught after four months in was in about 25 minutes, and I'll show it on, on the video, is a series of flights. And what happened was one plane was coming along and it was a relatively dry day in April. A plane would come along and only a little bit of the trail would stick. Only a part of it would remain visible. What was curious is that another plane came along and hit precisely the middle of that segment. And I'm like, that's odd. And then another plane came along and hit the end at an angle, not, not bisecting or perpendicular, but off at an angle. And I thought the light went off. There's something they're doing with geometry. It is establishing and setting up these resonances, these zones. Because what I had observed with a time-lapse camera is that the atmosphere had literally been layered, layers. Each two, three, four, five, eight thousand feet is probably variable from day to day. And the clouds would come up and then literally be chopped off. And, but that would only happen after a plane had come through and then the storm would collapse. And you can see it today. You can step out anytime you see thunderstorms beginning to go, the planes will be there. You know, so it all comes back to the sun. The sun is the power source for this solar system. The sun drives the weather. In the fall of 1998, I was asked by my employer, Environment News Service, a worldwide wire service dealing with environmental issues, to have a look at a VHS videotape. When I viewed the tape, I started laughing, frankly, I thought, Here's an hour and 10 minutes of shaky video footage of contrails. After 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I stopped laughing because as a former pilot and ocean navigator, I was well familiar with normal contrails. And what I was seeing on this videotape was not acting like a normal condensation trail. The trails coming out behind multiple airplanes, instead of dissipating, were lingering, spreading across the sky, until a blue sky day had turned into a milky, murky overcast. In my first story for Environment News Service in January 1999, I said that these mysterious contrails were sickening Americans. The illness patterns coincided precisely with so-called heavy spray days, particularly on weekends. People would see this gritting, uh, unusual activity, aerial activity in the sky, they would start to cough, they would get asthma attacks, severe enough to send them to emergency rooms. Doctors were telling the New York Times, we've never seen anything like this. People were dying in great numbers in the early days of this project, and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, went on record and said, we really don't know what this is. Um, 
It's not the flu. They called it an epidemic of mortalities. That was their, their phraseology for when this. When is this? This is 98, 99, and 2000, the winter months. This was reported in the United States, Canada, uh, in Peterborough, Ontario. The hospital there had 307 acute asthma admissions in a single day. In Birmingham, England, 8,000 people died in three weeks mostly elderly, it was in all the papers, BBC, they were using uh, meatpacking trucks as portable morgues. Uh, it was very drastic. All I can say as a journalist is this was coincident to videotape and, uh, and visual reports of tic-tac-toe patterns and uh, unusual gritting in the sky. They exactly coincided. So very dangerous, uh, very dangerous program. I'm standing on the roof of my building in the Bronx, New York. And as you can see, the entire sky, as far as you can see, it's blanketed with these chemtrails. <sighs> Stretching all the way over to Manhattan, or to New Jersey. There's another one being made as we speak. Saturday, March 10th, 2012. It's around noon time. And look at this, you can see this chemtrail here. It almost looks as if it's falling, falling onto the ground. You can see how it's dissipating at the very end there. Falling into the river or falling. Geoengineers are proposing spraying 10 to 20 million tons of toxic aluminum and other substances into our sky for the stated goal of cooling our planet. So let me distinguish these two different uh, kinds of geoengineering as clearly as I can. So the first one is we call solar radiation management, and that's the idea that you could put reflective, mostly reflective particles or other means to make the Earth whiter. Weather is part of our planet, it's part of our nature. Weather drives everything. Weather drives all of our food. So yeah, weather is creation. It's part of creation, and many people call that God. And uh, people who play with their weather or control our weather are playing God because they want power. Yeah. You control the weather, you control the planet. Uh, the, the IPCC is the organization within the uh, uh, WMO, and uh, uh, that's the international organization dealing with weather. Uh, and, uh, and it basically says that climate change is human caused. Uh, and will uh, have impacts on us now, and those impacts will become more and more significant over time. I believe the data uh, shows very clearly for anyone who truly does objective research that although they can cool regions, very large regions, temporarily, and of course toxically, the overall effect is a much worsened warming. The, the real issue in uh, chemtrails is what causes them to be persistent. And I don't know that answer yet, but, but, but if, if you can cause a calm trail to be consistent, that is persistent, that is to stay out in the atmosphere longer so it can create a cloud. Uh, what is the mechanism for that? What, what has changed in that jet to cause the calm trail behind it to persist as opposed to dissipate? Uh, is that a natural phenomenon because we have more moisture in the air? Is it a natural phenomenon because the stratosphere is getting colder? Is it an additive that they put the jet fuel? Is it truly a chemical that they spray with the uh, jet afterwards? I don't know. Uh, but, but, but the very term persistent calm trail is, is used so as to indicate it's different from a calm trail. So my question is, what's the additive? What, what, what got added to cause it to be persistent? I can say this, that uh, for any skeptic, I would ask them, why would I not believe geoengineering is the source of this when one, the patents describe exactly what we see in the air, the express goal is to block the sun, two, the ingredients on the ground are exactly what those patents state as primary ingredients. Three, you have administration officials like John Holden of the Obama administration openly stating their support for geoengineering. Four, you have scientific groups like the Arctic Methane Emergency Group openly calling for emergency wartime geoengineering. It it's, can easily be found and researched by anyone who chooses to look up the AMIG group, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. 
The danger, of course, with geoengineering is the one I was referring to a moment ago. We don't understand the system well enough to predict its responses in detail, and that means there's always a danger if you try to engineer the system on a large scale that you will do something that has side effects that are worse than the dimension of the problem you're trying to cure with the geoengineering in the first place. Uh, there are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit. What is occurring is the deliberate and systematic alteration of the uh, ecosystem of this planet uh, through a physical means of injecting uh, particulate matter, extremely fine particulate matter into the atmosphere. I look at it at this point as a global scale operation. And I, I examined those questions about whether or not it was physically feasible to modify the entire atmosphere. And at the beginning, that seemed a little bit of a stretch. It was not a uh, set answer to me at all. But you'll find when you study the atmosphere that actually it is quite feasible and the atmosphere is much more delicate and fragile than many of us might realize. If you just want to trust government, you can just let it all happen. But if you want to try to get a public dialogue going, I think the best thing is for um, state governments who are at risk uh, to begin inquiring as to what the government is going to do. I'm just wanting the government to be truthful so that the citizens can make honest decisions about their future. Pictures don't lie. That's all there is to it. It's like, uh, it's like the way the government uses red light cameras to enforce traffic violations. The photographs are evidence. It's that simple. Look at this picture of Central Park. Does this look normal to you? I mean, the coloring, the weird purples and greens and blues that are in these stripes. I remember this day, December 6th. Uh, I was walking towards the Empire State Building and I saw a plane cutting directly across the uh, building. And I called Steve and I said, Steve, we gotta take some pictures today, man. So we went out and we got these photographs, unsuspecting people just going about their daily lives. In the meantime, look up. What do you see? Does that look normal to you? I'm a director of photography by trade. That's what I do, I take pictures. I've been doing this for 20 years plus, and I can tell you what I'm seeing in the skies is different now than it's ever been. They can't, you can't hide this. You simply can't hide this. That's why I believe this issue will be known one way or the other. We want people to look into this. We want people to question. We want people to look into what geoengineers are denying they're doing, but state, they urgently want to do. The problem is when you do the research, there's a clause that's called informed consent. And informed consent, my understanding, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding of informed consent is when you don't protest, you're basically allowing the government or allowing the military to experiment on you and your children. So when they say, well, possibly we can modify hurricanes or we could modify the storm. They don't really need to say what the other things are or how they do it or what the human health implications are or the environmental health implications are. But by not refusing, you are basically giving your informed consent that you're okay with being a guinea pig for these experiments. So do I think there's persistent comm trails in the sky? Yes. On a clear day, you can go up and look at them. Anybody who wants to look at them can see them. They're not short uh, streams of cloud-like uh, things you can see, they're very long, they go from horizon to horizon. So it isn't, there isn't a question of what they are, it, uh, or are they in existence, they are. The, the literature talks about it, including the IPCC. So the word persistent contrail is in the scientific um, uh, documents where they're observing phenomena. So I'm hopeful that as uh, the discussion enlarges around geoengineering and the public is invited to enter the debate or enters it regardless, that chemtrails will be brought out of the closet, will be brought forward, and that the chemtrail community, the movement, can enter this discussion. And I would suggest, first of all, by dropping the word chemtrails. It's become a poisoned word, and we can use it as code among ourselves for the media, for the public. We use the words of the scientists of the international debate, we call it stratospheric aerosols, which is what they are. We call it SRM, solar radiation management. We call it geoengineering. We call it climate engineering. All of those are accepted scientific terms. If we can do that, we can bring this whole chemtrails discussion into the broader discussion of geoengineering and finally have a public influence on a very dangerous program. So now let's talk about what we're gonna do. What can we do? What are the options? Obviously, this is taking place, so my question is, while we're in these times of 
tight budgets and firing school teachers and firing emergency services and discontinuing food for the needy and help for the elderly. How much does this program cost? How much is it costing taxpayers every day or every year? We need public oversight, we need public disclosure, so this technology, the, these actions and these, these massive budgets can be used for the people and not against them. The reason I'm in this, this battle, uh, one that I never wanted in my worst nightmare, is because if, if I can't walk out my door and breathe without sucking in a lung full of toxic metals and my children uh, can't breathe without sucking this stuff in, I simply have no choice but to try as hard as I can to expose this issue. So what to do? We need participation. We need your help. This is an initiative-based documentary. It's not just a documentary that you can watch and think about. This is a documentary that hopefully helps you to take action with a grassroots type strategy. Get the app, go on the website, send us your photos, let the lawmakers know that you're not okay with it. All right, so I guess this is the official start. Something really strange happened. I got this uh, 5D camera and I got a time lapse on it. Now it's filming some clouds. But then uh, yesterday something really crazy happened. I noticed something that's really disturbing. The trails from the jets turned into the clouds. They wouldn't evaporate, they didn't go away. And as the day went on, I noticed now they were in patterns. It looks like they're spraying something. It looks like there's spray coming out of the back of the planes. So now, as a director of photography, I've got a variety of high quality tools at my disposal. And I'm gonna go get some uh, some new lenses, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take a closer look at this. And I thought that it's appropriate that I, uh, I don't know, that I start this, I start documenting what I'm doing. You know, it's the next day, Thursday, and uh, I got some new things to get some better shots for from whatever's going on here. <clears throat> and I'm going to adapt this uh, telescope to a real a real tripod and then figure out how to put a camera on the back of it. That's the story. Hopefully this will be the new lens. I don't know if this is going to work. We'll get it to work. Okay. Alright, well, here it is. We'll see if it's going to work. I see through it. That's a good sign. Okay. All right, so I'm at exit 103, and it looks like I'm at the edge of where the spraying has been taking place. I'm going to see if I can get a good shot to take some photos of this. Damn it. All right, so I'm in Harris, and I am chased by the cops again. What the f <sighs> Harris, New York. I do not know what's going on, man, but nobody wants me taking any pictures of the f sky. I gotta find a place to hide. I can't believe I gotta hide to take pictures of the damn sky. I can't even go to a park. So, I am back at the East Delaware intake for the New York City water supply. And I was thinking of maybe setting up to shoot over here. Um, but there is a New York City um, hazmat truck parked where I was thinking of filming. This is where the uh, cop chased me away last time. Kind of strange for a hazmat division to be at the New York City water supply. I'm gonna see if I can set up some cameras here. Get a little better view of this. I got a GoPro mounted on, I don't know. Can you see out the window? Probably. Ah, uh -huh. here they go. I guess they left. DEP 
P trucks going the other way. Um, Alright, well, anyway, there you have it. I'm going to shut off the other camera. Curious. Curious stuff. So what I came across in July through the uh, stop motion time-lapse photography by accident was this, uh, this aerosol spraying that is showed up to be a geoengineering type experiment or possible military activity on at least a U.S. scale, possibly a, a global scale. It's not natural, the clouds are being manufactured. There's fallout from it, it's washing down in the form of rain into the water and the soil resulting in us drinking whatever the chemicals are in this aerosol spray. And the other byproduct, which is the uh, global dimming, which is also disturbing. So whether it's a solar radiation management or geoengineering uh, effort, there are absolute side effects and, and consequences that, that may actually be catastrophic. In, an increasing amount of days um, saw these patterns occurring in the skies overhead and a subsequent diminishment of my solar uptake and uh, it increased with every year. So about 2004 is when I really started my investigation as to um, what could be happening in the skies above because it was too inconsistent. One day would be a, a grid pattern and uh, another day would be uh, virtually nothing with very similar atmospheric conditions. I've, I've been studying meteorology since the late 90s as well. So clearly there was something happening and, and it, it took no time at all to come to the, the geoengineering um, issue and a mountain of data. I researched the subject of geoengineering which seemed to describe exactly what I was seeing in the skies above which was solar obscuration. Um, that's the, the primary goal of SAG, Stratospheric Aerosol Geoengineering, and SRM, Solar Radiation Management. The primary goal of these patents like stratospheric wells box seeding for reduction of global warming is a primary patent and, and, and the stated goal is to block the sun. And quite uh, clearly that's what was happening with my solar PV system. So seeing the first ingredient in that patent is aluminum, I began to do rain tests. I, uh, first test was seven parts per billion, which according to a um, hydrogeologist was already quite high given my location, a filtered forested location. It's not near any sort of industry, urban setting, anything. Subsequent tests over the next five years escalated as much as 3,450 parts per billion of aluminum in a single rain test. So if you have virtually every dot connecting, and we know these materials aren't coming from China, that's the first thing many people state, but California Air Quality Resources Board has done studies on the aerosols from China, and aluminum simply is not amongst them. Metals don't float across oceans with the exception of mercury. Global dimming is a term most are not familiar with, and, and the latest figures show fully 20% of the sun's direct rays that reached the planet several decades ago no longer do. I mean, this is the biggest elephant in the room, absolutely the biggest in the room. And, it, and I believe that if it could be brought to a level where there was enough cover for all the scientists, all the meteorologists, all the biologists, all the academia that knows this is going on, I believe they would pour from every corner. I, I do, but they, they would have to have the cover because I, I know people with California Department of Fish and Game that are absolutely beside themselves that this is going on. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different than normal. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought, and that the side effects are harder to manage. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible.